Stay hungry, stay foolish. You'll get there faster if you just slow down. Today's episode offers a bit of perspective and a lot of insight for anyone seeking long-term success. Success in business is spelled M-O-R-E. Better results, faster growth, more revenue, greater efficiency. Do more, make more, achieve more. Eventually, ambition turns to stress, then turns to frenzy, then turns to emptiness, as once ambitious workers endlessly trudge the hamster wheel chasing the next promotion. While top-level performance is the holy grail of business at all levels, there is another much better way to achieve it. Slow down. Yes, you heard that right. S-L-O-W. This is your permission to jump off the hamster wheel now. Slowing down is not a luxury, it's a necessity. A frenetic brain simply doesn't perform at optimal levels. By maintaining a snail's pace, you actually achieve better results at rocket speed because you're firing on all cylinders. You'll think of new things, approach old problems from new perspectives, and breathe a fresh breath of air into everything you do. This book shows you how to achieve this state of steady, sustainable fire and how to get further by crawling than you ever did while you were attempting to fly. We welcome author of Master Your Mind, Counterintuitive Strategies to Refocus and Re-Energize Your Runaway Brain, Roger Sipe. Welcome to the show. It's awesome to be here, Aiden. I appreciate you having me on. What do you think of that beautiful intro, man? I mean, that's solid gold. <laughs> <laughs> solid gold. Let's jump into it. I mentioned there the idea of slowing down. This book was catalyzed by this idea that you had a realization when you were going faster, but you realized slowing down would actually make you go faster when you were passed in a marathon by a four and a half foot granny. It actually wasn't even a marathon, Aiden. It was just it was just a morning run. <laughs> <laughs> I have run a couple marathons, but the incident that you're describing that I write about in the book actually just happened on a morning when I was out, but it really did lay the foundation for this particular work and kind of catalyzed the whole idea was this idea, that thing that you're talking about happened when I was in the middle of, I would call it almost like a laboratory experiment in slowing down to get faster that I didn't really realize I was even in until I was almost all the way through it. Um, I, I, I am a runner. Uh, and I, I like being a physically fit person. And uh, yeah, I, I had done a couple of marathons. I had uh, I'd been a distance runner for a while, which was a special challenge for me. I'm not really built for distance running. And so what my, 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 my long term, what my pattern had been is that I would train hard and I would get faster and get better, but then I would injure myself. And I had this cycle going on for years of where I would really enjoy running and working out. And then I would be not able to do it at all for several months. And so I, I, I kind of realized, man, I've got to do something a little different here because this is just not sustainable. And so I started learning about how to, I, I started learning about as many of your listeners probably do, started learning about things like keto and about um, just how to use fat as fuel when you're running. Like this was all you know about athletics and high performance in life. And um, one of the things that I came across was this whole concept of learning how to train aerobically. Um, I'm not going to get into all of like the nerd ball science of what that means, but it basically means that you 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 do what you do, run, bike, swim, whatever you do, and uh, you do it in a way that keeps your heart rate below what's called your aerobic threshold, where you're you're burning oxygen instead of sugar, you're burning fat instead of sugar to fuel your your workout. Well, the thing about it is, is that to do it, you have to, as a runner, you have to run painfully slow. Like to keep my heart rate low enough, what I had had to do is take my eight minute mile down to literally like a 12 minute mile. And I felt like I was just embarrassed to be out running, but I was like, okay, you know, I've, the science backs this up and I'll give this a try. And I didn't know if it was working, didn't know if it was working. I was, you know, pretty patient with it for a couple months. And then, yeah, I had this morning where I was out for a run, trying to keep my heart rate down. So I'm, you know, chugging along pretty slow and I'm just getting passed by people on, on the trail. And, um, 
Right. And it, I mean, I'm a competitive person, right? So when I get passed on a run, like it kind of fires me up a little bit. So the first guy runs by me and I was like, oh, that's no problem. He's like wearing a you know university track team shirt. He clearly is an actual like competitive runner, 6'4", you know, runs like a gazelle. And he go, and I was like, OK, no problem. Like, like that guy passing me, no problem. And then um, about five minutes later, this lovely young woman um, – Passes me up again. It comes from behind and just moves on past me. And I'm like, wait, God, I just got passed again. Uh, well, okay. You know, fit young person, you know, probably 20 years younger than me. All right, whatever. And then about 10 minutes later, I hear footsteps behind me and I look past me and no joke, Aiden, it's a four and a half foot grandma. She's legitimately 75 to 80 years old. <laughs> and she just kind of goes running by me, pats me on the back and goes, you keep it up, Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> and we're joined on the line by Becky. Oh, Becky, my. welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's just set aside how ridiculous it is that I'm thinking I'm in a race when I'm basically just on a bike path. But I did. I kind of had this moment where I went, all right, is this even working? This whole slowing down thing, is it actually working? And I found out that it really was, right? I had intentionally for a couple months, I had been running much slower than I was accustomed to. I'd been pretty rigorous about this training method and I hadn't tested myself at all. And so I went, well, let me just see if this is actually working. And seriously, Aiden, when I actually did a test of, of speed at my prescribed heart rate, in a period of a couple months, my mile time, had dropped by about two minutes. Like I was substantially faster from going slower. And I went, wow, that doesn't make any sense at all. But then all of these things that I had, all these lessons that I had learned um, in sales and in business and mentors of mine, you know, that had taught me about things like slowing your rate of speech down sometimes in a presentation about, you know, taking time out to reflect. And I went, no, this is actually a life principle. You, if you want to get results faster, you have to have the discipline to slow yourself down strategically. And sometimes you have to have the discipline to just stop entirely and do nothing but look around. I thought this was a great way to start the book because there's a quote by Picasso, and he said that every act of creation is first an act of destruction. And why I mention that is, if you think about we finish college, we go into the workforce, and that's it for many of us. But we don't learn how to learn, we don't learn how to work, we don't learn how to work effectively. We may pick up some nice little habits here or there, but mainly we pick up not so positive habits. And what I loved about here is, you're talking about this, you're like, break it down, and then build it back up again. And you give the ingredients of how to build it back up. So let's jump into the book because you do a brilliant job of bringing all the parts together, all the bits you deconstructed, and then they become Lego bricks that you build back up again. Oh my gosh. And where, you're making where me feel, I have to say, Aiden, you're making me feel really good about this. <laughs> like, I love the book too, and it's done well, and we've, you know, we've sold quite a few of them, but. I, I just I really appreciate the depth of your understanding about this. Cool. Well, pleasure, man. I really enjoyed it. And I'd love to break it down for a listener. And what you say in the book to the reader is when you're reading this and as you're listening to this as the listener, try and pick out some small parts that you can implement straight away. And the reason you say that is when you do that, when you make that intention, you will actually way more likely to actually put them into place. So I'm going to call that out now and park that. Okay. So I'm asking the listener to do that because there's so much in this. But let's jump back into part one of the book where you say, let's understand ourselves a little better. Let's break down the Lego bricks, take it apart. And you talk particularly about the brain. You start with a description of what you mean by slowing down and the cure for what you call the common go. Right. So when we talk about the cure for the common go, my understanding of your listener base is these are people who are results oriented, who have careers that they are excited about, motivated about moving forward. And I would imagine that a lot of them operate in high pressure environments. And so the, the common response to that is that people just default to 
okay, I've just got to work more. I've got to put in more. I, if I'm going to get where I want to go, if I'm going to beat the competition, if I'm going to get the promotion, meet the quota, make the sale, whatever, I've just got to work harder, which you know what? That works up to a point, right? When somebody is new in their career, we work with a lot of like financial advisors, sales professionals, people who are actually in the, in the profession of building some kind of book of business. And listen, when you're doing that at first, like if you've, if you've actually started a startup, for example, yes, there is a threshold of effort that needs to be met, right? You can't just go, ah, I'm just going to, you know, sit around and meditate and, and chant and bags of money will fall out of the sky. Like you got to work. But once a person reaches the threshold of effort, which, you know, typically looks like a full-time job, 40, maybe 50 hours a week. Once you're there, the math just breaks and you can't get where you want to go by just putting in more hours, right? I mean, if you're working 40 hours, okay, sure. If you go, okay, everything else is equal. Let me just double the number of hours that I work and let's go to 80. You know, you might have an argument for, okay, that'll double my results, except you can only do that once because if you double it again, well, guess what? The week's only got 168 hours in it, so you just can't do it very often. And that's not actually how life works. That what happens is when you just increase volume of effort or how quote unquote hard you run, it pretty quickly, be, the, the quality of your work will change and like, uh, and like fall off a cliff. So what we found, there's this whole, everybody talks about working smarter, not harder. And so what, what you really have to do is you have to learn how to not just get more hours in. You have to learn to get more quality into those hours. And you see this, Aiden, with probably a lot of the people that you've interviewed on this show would, would talk about this. But you see this with the most successful, most you know, effective CEOs, leaders, producers, is if you talk to them and if they'll let you in a little bit, you'll see where they all have habits of literally going away on retreats for a couple days, a couple times a year. Uh, Bill Gates was famous for talking about how he would give himself a week at a time to do nothing but just think. You'll see how people have th things built into their day like meditation, reflection, planning, strategizing, all things that you cannot do if you're running, you have to stop and slow down to do them. So yeah, in life and in business, it's, it's not just about going all the time. It's about going at light speed or better in bursts that are sort of um, punctuated by times where a person just stops, slows down, looks around, thinks, recharges, and sort of re-energizes for another burst of lightning speed. You mentioned there, Bill Gates, you mentioned highly successful people. Not all of us are like that. So you help us diagnose ourselves and you pose us some questions in the book. I'd love if you pose those questions now, just to get our audience again thinking, is this you? And where you do this in particular is to go and diagnose the runaway brain with all of us. Right. A lot of times people are like, you're talking about my, my runaway brain. Do I actually have a runaway brain? Most people, when I'm speaking with them or coaching them, they don't really need to ask diagnostic questions. They just kind of go, oh, yeah, I just know my brain. I just I just know I do. But if you're wondering, um, right, some of the questions that I would ask is, OK, have you ever had the experience where you met somebody for the first time, business or recreational setting. You met this person, you shook their hand, got their name, and then like five seconds later, you couldn't remember their name. Yes, Robert. Okay, Eddie. <laughs> 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 this is only everybody has had that experience. And if you've ever had that experience, I mean, yeah, sure, it's embarrassing and it's, it's stressful and it can be a little bit awkward. But that happens because your brain ran away for a few minutes. It just left, right? You were on, It was on something else. Um, if you've ever had the experience where you were reading something 
again, business or just for pleasure, reading something, got to the end of a page, and then realized that your mind had been elsewhere and you had no idea what you'd been reading for the previous few minutes, runaway brain. Um, and then I think that, so those things, and again, we don't need to get into all of the nerdy science on it, but like those two experiences, we talk about them all the time with our clients, the, the name thing and the reading thing, really all they are is just brain things. Like they come, those two experiences are just manifestations of the same kind of wiring in your brain. And that wiring that causes the name thing and the reading thing to happen continuously for a lot of people will also create what I think is sort of the, the central problem. It's, I, I just call it, it's an experience I call having that day. And it's the day where, okay, you showed up at work and you worked really, really hard all day long, or at least it felt like you worked really, really hard all day long to the point where at the end of your business day, end of your work day, you found that you were just out of gas. You had nothing, you had no time and no energy left for the people and the things that matter most outside of work. And then if we're going to get real honest, it's embarrassingly common for people to then have a day like that where they go, man, I feel like I worked my brains out and I'm wiped. But then they look back on what happened during that work day. And if they're honest, they have to go the heck. Like I, 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 I just spun my wheels all day. I feel like I worked my brains out. But what did I actually accomplish of any real impact? And the answer often leaves people uh, a little deflated, right? So to answer your question with these questions, if a person has ever experienced any of those things, I would tell you that you've definitely experienced the quote unquote runaway brain in ways that are simple to fix. And you would benefit a ton from addressing. I'd love if we got into a little bit more. So in, in chapter two, you go more into the subconscious mind and the difference between the conscious yes. and the subconscious. This is, I love this chapter, man. It's and my I favorite. Loved, it's my, it was my favorite chapter to write. It's like my, oh, favorite, beautiful, it's like my favorite beautiful. thing to talk about. I really want to focus on this. What I really love to get across is this. It's a lens through which you change how you see the world, actually. If you get this right, it really, really does change. And you can really help program yourself. This chapter and the next chapter on the brain waves, the different brain states we go through. I'd love to really focus on that. And that seems to be your mode of excellence, which I, which is great. So let's introduce the analogy of the ant and the elephant. I think this perfectly encapsulates it. It did for me too. And to be clear, I did not come up with this idea. I credit Vince Pocente in the book. He wrote a book. It's one of those books that takes like an hour and a half to read. <laughs> like It's just a super easy. It's actually a it's almost written like a children's, it's a business fable is what it is. And it's called The Ant and the Elephant. I would recommend it for anybody who's listening to this show, but I'll give you kind of the Cliff Notes version of it. The book is basically about this ant. Like the main character in the, in, in the book is an ant. And uh, he has this experience where there's a big storm and he gets like removed, he gets blown away from his colony. So he has like this dark night of the soul where he's isolated from everything that he knows and he's sort of reflecting on the quality of his life and he realizes he doesn't really enjoy his life as an ant very much right now he's like man you know i'm supposed to work hard all summer to have food in the winter but you know it seems like my colony is actually kind of in a place of scarcity like there just isn't enough so what happens is i'm just I'm just working 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 all the time and i never get to really see the fruits of it and i'm pretty frustrated with that and um, it's 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 technically a leadership book. So this ant is a he's a supervisor ant in his colony, <laughs> and so uh, he's like, yeah. And I don't even know if I'm like a very good leader. And you know, truthfully, the real issue here is that I feel like I just feel like my life is supposed to be much bigger and more prosperous and more meaningful and more connected, but I just don't know how to get there. And so he's you know kind of kind of down on himself. Well, this conversation that the ant is having with himself is overheard by the, an owl. The wise old owl sort of flies over and says, hey, Mr. Ant, you seem a little frustrated with yourself. And the ant goes, yeah, I am a little frustrated. You know, I mean, I'm a freaking little ant and I'm supposed to, <laughs> you know, work hard all summer to have food in the winter, but it never works that way. So I'm just working all the time and I'm 
frustrated with my life and I feel like I'm supposed to have a bigger, more abundant, more prosperous, more meaningful life, but I just don't know how to get there. And the owl says, that's what I thought you were going to say. So there's some good news and there's some bad news and there's some good news here. And he goes, here's the, the good news is that you definitely can have this life that you're talking about. Like what, what you're talking about, this life that you've, that you've sort of been dreaming about is in fact possible, but not where you are currently. You're going to need to get to the oasis. There, there's this place called the oasis. And he has like the oasis. I've heard, I thought that was just a myth. And the owl goes, no, it's a real place. Um, and, you know, and when you're there, that's, there's abundant resources. There's plenty of food and there's plenty of water and all the other cool animals are hanging out there. So it's great for networking. Uh, <laughs> and so it's, you know, but you, so you're going to need to get to the oasis. So the good news is that you, that you can do that. Now, here's the bad news. You, you can't see this, Mr. Ant. This is still the owl talking. Mr. Ant, you can't see this because of your ant's perspective, but I can see this. Your real problem is that you live on the back of an elephant, Mr. Ant. In fact, your whole colony that you've lived with for your whole life has existed on the back of an elephant. And the ant's going, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes, here's the owl says, here's, here's the bad news. This oasis that you want to get to is not that far away. It's due east of here. The problem that you've got, Mr. Ant, is that this elephant that you live on currently is walking west. And because of some things that happened to this el to your elephant when it was a baby elephant, it has a tendency to walk in any direction except towards the oasis. So let's just pause, let's pause the cliff notes here for a second. Just look at the physics of this here. You, you've probably figured this out by now, listeners, that what the book is actually about is about the, it's about the relationship between your conscious brain and your subconscious brain. If you want to, Aiden, we can get into how we all have two brains. Please do. I think this is brilliant. The way you describe yeah. this in this chapter, you nail it. Yeah. You actually, you, me, everybody, you have two brains. And so there's, listen, there's, there's some authors who I really like that will tell you you have up to four or six brains, but let's just stick with the brain in your head for right now. You definitely have two brains. You got your conscious brain and your subconscious brain. Conscious brain, obviously, is the part that you use with awareness. The subconscious brain is the part that does its thing without you trying, without you even knowing. And the subconscious brain is vastly, for all practical purposes, the subconscious is infinitely larger neurologically and from just a straight horsepower perspective when it comes to actually getting results. What the ant and the elephant is really all about, it's about the relationship between your conscious and your subconscious brain. Conscious brain represented by the ant, small and kind of whiny. <laughs> <laughs> subconscious brain represented by your elephant, big and powerful, but, and very simple in its thinking. We'll get to that in just a second here. So let's get back to the story. Ant realizes, I live on the back of an elephant. This elephant is walking in the opposite direction from where I actually want to get to. And, and just get the picture in your head. The deal is that it, success, getting to the oasis, is not about the ant running faster, right? It's about getting the elephant to move in the right direction. And so now the ant goes, well, Mr. Owl, are you saying I'm doomed? Like I live on the back of an elephant who's walking away from where I want to get to. Are you telling me that I'm never going to get to the oasis? And the owl says, no, you didn't listen. I said, there's good news. I said, there's bad news. And I said, then there's good news. And in fact, it's really good news. Yeah, the bad news is you live on this huge, powerful beast that's taking you away from where you want to get to. But the good news is that out of all the creatures in the jungle, Mr. Ant, ants like yourself are best equipped to talk to elephants. And so if you can talk, if, if you can just learn how to talk to your elephant in the way that he can understand, 
you can definitely get your elephant turned around. And the really good news about that is that if you can get your elephant moving in the right direction, if you can get your elephant moving towards the oasis, you know what, Mr. Ant? You can pretty much screw up everything else (laughs) and you're still going to get there. And I love this because you described this so well. And I'd love if you did this next exercise because you say the language of the subconscious is pictures. So what we imagine, and this is why the ideas of vision boards and having a vision in the first place. And as you say, the clarity of vision is so important because the subconscious is like a preschooler, doesn't understand or register the word no. So if I go, I don't want to be sick. It goes, okay, you want to be sick? I'll find ways for us to get sick. And this is really important, but you bring it to life here and we can do this brilliantly because it's audio. The fake lemon exercise. Let's do this for our listeners. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, the the background on this and the, and the point of, of the exercise is that it, you just said it, but I want to make sure our, our, our listeners are getting this. There's a language difference. There's a language barrier between your conscious and your subconscious brain. There's obviously a huge size difference, as we just discussed, but there's also a language difference. Your aunt, your conscious brain, thinks like we think of thinking. It thinks logically. It uses reason. It understands consequences and things like if-then thinking. Your elephant is totally not like that. It's purely visual. Purely visual. All your elef- all your subconscious brain does is it sees pictures and then moves towards them. If you want to think about it like an actual elephant, no no joke, Aiden, what your elephant does is it receives an instruction or it sees a picture and it goes, okay, okay, I'll go get that for you. <laughs> and it gets to work on it like instantaneously. So here's what I would invite our listeners to do. This was an exercise that was, gosh, I, I had this, I, I learned this from one of my greatest mentors of all time, Ed Foreman, like 25 years ago, and I thought, wow, this is this is pretty cool. All right, so here's what I'd love for our listeners to do, and you can do this right now too. Even if you've done it before, it still works. So in your, you can do it eyes open or eyes closed, but in your mind, I just would, I want you to just picture a lemon and get a good clear picture of it in your mind. What color is it? Obviously, it's yellow, but really get a good picture of that lemon. See the bumpy, waxy peel and the two sort of knobby things on the end. And what I'd, what I'd love for you to do is hold it in your hand and kind of feel the weight of this lemon. Now, all right, take this lemon in your mind's eye, set it down on a wooden cutting board, take a nice sharp knife and cut it in half right down the middle. And now let's look at the inside of it. You see all like the, the little citrus, the, the pie shaped segments. They like, oh, you cut a seed in half right there. So there's like half a seed that you're looking at. It's kind of shiny. You got a little juice dripping down the back of your wrist right now. All right, take that lemon, hold it up to your nose. Just smell it. Smell that good, clean, lemony, citrusy smell. All right, now what I'd like you to do in your mind's eyes, open your mouth, shove that half a lemon in your mouth and just bite down on it. Taste that sour lemon juice and that bitter kind of chunky peel. Okay, exercise is now officially over. You can pause. (laughs) And so it's, it's, it's funny to watch people do like when I can do this with a group in person, it's funny to watch the reaction, but I, I would bet Aiden that any of our listeners that just did that, even if they did it kind of halfway right now, what they're doing is they are swallowing a mouthful of saliva because their mouth just started watering. Many of them, their face tensed up, Right. Probably, you know, you like you actually tasted and felt that sour lemon juice and that bit like it scrunched up your face and a lot of people like their shoulders all tensed up. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I, I had it even though I've done the exercise several you, you, times. You, you, every you, time. Every you, time. You, you knew what was coming and, and here here's the reason why. It's because your elephant, your subconscious brain, literally, it sees pictures. And it will cause you to act like that picture is real, even if it's not. Your your elephant legitimately cannot tell the difference between reality and a vividly imagined picture, which means that the application of this, you, you mentioned this as well, the single biggest thing that an achiever can do, that a business person can do, anybody who's interested in results of any kind, 
the single biggest thing that you can do to start moving yourself towards them effortlessly is to simply upgrade your clarity about what that picture looks like for you. The clearer the picture in your mind of what you want and then why you want that, is the biggest thing that starts moving you towards them in ways that sometimes almost, they literally, literally almost feel like magic. Because when your elephant perceives that picture of the first time you make six figures, or when you become a millionaire, or when your company achieves certain goals, or when you lose 20 pounds and get in the best shape of your life, when your elephant can see that picture and go, okay, I'll go get that for you. <laughs> it is amazing how quickly things happen. Now, you also mentioned something. Can I just roll into the whole thing about please how you're- Please do, please do. Yeah. The whole thing about how, that you mentioned about how your subconscious doesn't register the word no is key to understand. And this was, this was mind-blowing to me when I learned it. And I have so many of my clients that are like, wow, this, makes, this explains so much. Right. The third thing that you really want to know about your elephant, number one, size difference, two, thinks in pictures, it's purely visual, three, doesn't register the word no. Your elephant literally does not, it's not that it doesn't understand the word no, it just doesn't register it at all. And the example that I always use with people is you think about a kid, you think about like a, a toddler, a toddler or a preschooler is probably the best example of this. You take a three or four year old kid and if you tell that kid not to do something, Aiden, I actually don't know if you have children or not. I do. I have two boys, nine and six. And since you told me about this, I've been almost hypnotizing them <laughs> at night time. It's so funny, <laughs> isn't it? That's great, man. It's so good. You tell a kid of that age, you tell your six, yeah, your six year old's starting to get it probably a little bit better. But when your kids were four or five, if you told that kid not to do something, what was going to happen immediately, Aiden? They'll do it. They'll do the exact thing that you just told them not to mm -hmm. do. And I'll tell you, man, my kid, especially my youngest, was like notorious for this. And what it felt like, I'd say, hey, buddy, hey, don't run out in the street. Right? He's getting ready to play outside. I say, hey, don't run out in the street. And immediately he's running out in the street. And what it felt like to me as his dad was it felt like he was looking at me, hearing me say, don't run out in the street. It felt like he was processing that, looking me in the eyes and going, screw that. I'm going to do whatever you uh, want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It felt like we were having a fight. We were not having a fight. Here's what's going on with young children. The, the, the part of the brain that governs conscious thinking, the ant part of the brain, doesn't actually start developing in a human being until around age six or seven. And so what that means is, Aiden, when your kids were four and five, they literally didn't have an ant. They didn't have the part of the brain that can understand logic and reasoning and consequences. It just saw pictures. It just, all little kids have is an elephant. And that elephant literally doesn't register the word no. So when I would say to my kid, hey, don't run out in the street, what his little brain perceived was run out in the street. And then all that elephant knows how to do is go street. Okay, I'll go get that for you. And it starts moving him towards the street, like on a rope. This reminded me of a quote, and it's attributed to different people, Aristotle, for Great. example, but it's also a Jesuit maxim, and it's give me a child until he is seven, and I will show you the man. And what I take from that is you can program somebody in those early years because of this, because the elephant is running mm. the show. So therefore, we need to be so bloody important how we talk to children, how we influence them, the habits that we instill with them, because they learn from seeing and we learn from pictures. So therefore, the information we feed them is so vitally important. Aiden, you just helped me make this connection. Nice. Because a young child doesn't have that conscious, that conscious brain, that ant, that logical part of us. Well, one of the things that the ant does is it filters information. and and a kid doesn't have the filter. Right. So when you're working with a child that only has an elephant, that only has the subconscious, the input goes in unfiltered and sort of unadulterated. And so it downloads all the way. Right. This is why I've never heard that Jesuit maxim before, but it totally makes sense. Yeah, man. They want to program kids, you know, and we had Bruce Lipton on this show before. He's the 
founder of the idea of epigenetics where purpose can actually control the outcome of your life massively and he talked about massively about subconscious programming but i just think if everybody knew how important this is you'd be very careful what you let your kids read what you let them watch who you let them hang about and this is the whole idea of you know you are the sum of the people you hang around with most because you absorb all their information right for our purposes here today i'll bring it back to adults for just a moment here because the deal is with kids, the way that you turn that around, go back to what we were talking about before, about how when you tell a kid not to do something, they're going to do it because that's all their brain knows how to do. The reason that we're, I think for your listeners, Aiden, the reason that we're even talking about kids this much is because as hotshot business people, we're actually not that much different from a four-year-old kid. Sure, we now have an aunt that can help guide and filter and make decisions, but that aunt is still riding on top of an elephant. That It still is your elephant, your subconscious, that carries all the horsepower for forward movement, and that elephant still doesn't register the word no. So what I would, you know, if, if I was coaching our listeners I would tell you that one of the biggest things that you can do for yourself is to stop focusing on what you don't want. So many people, it's fine to identify, hey, I want to avoid this obstacle or, you know, I don't want to end up in the, you know, I don't want to end up on the street. Fine to identify that, actually healthy to identify that. But you got to stop focusing on those things. It's, um, you started alluding to this before that, right, when people kind of go, hey, all right, so I don't want to be late for this deadline. Just think about that for a second. You said, I don't want to be late for the deadline. Elephant goes, uh, elephant hears every part of that except the don't. <laughs> <laughs> you said, I don't want to be late for the deadline. Elephant hears late for the deadline and goes, late for the deadline. Okay, I'll go get that for you. Somebody goes, I, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be broke. Elephant hears, I want to be broke and goes, Broke. Okay, I'll go get that for you. Yeah, th I guess maybe to put this part to bed, one of the, the, the maybe the last thing that you want to understand about this elephant is that, it, and I don't even really write about this in the book very much, but it's important to understand that your subconscious doesn't judge the pictures. It doesn't evaluate the pictures that it sees or the instructions that it receives. It just acts upon them. It doesn't know and doesn't, fundamentally, your subconscious just doesn't even think about is this actually where I want to go it just sees the picture and goes towards it right and it'll do whatever you tell it to do so be careful give give, um, give your kids positive instructions I found that it worked way better when I started telling my kid what to do instead of what not to do and uh, my, our coaching clients are the same way make sure you're focusing your mind on what you want instead of what you don't want just stop worrying about stuff so much there's another maxim, actually, which you may have heard, is worrying is praying for what you do not want. And that's exactly it, right. Yeah, because you're, you're just bringing it into existence because that becomes your focus then. So as you said, let's, let's move on because we're going to run out of time and there's so much in the book. We're, not even, we're only on chapter two, by the way. The next idea reminded me of how to replace habits that do not serve us. And you know the way they say the best way to replace a habit is create a new one to replace that. And you say the elephant, the subconscious, cannot unsee a picture, but it can replace a picture with a new one. I think this is a really important concept. For those who feel they've already been programmed, you can overwrite the program. You can. I learned this from um, Charles Duhigg's work, The Power of Habit. I thought this was fantastic where he talks about right you, uh, every habit that we have has a corresponding sort of neural pathway wiring in our brain. And once that wiring is laid down, it will be there. It will be there in some sort of faded fashion, basically forever. You can't just you, you can't just leave a habit behind because it's literally wired into your brain. But what you can do is you can layer a new habit over it, right? And it requires a consistent period. It, it it will of course require some discipline for uh of of consistent patterned activity or thought for a period of time. And so, you know, there's, I mean, you know this, there's so much debate about 
uh, you know, how long does it take to form a habit? I mean, everybody seems to know it takes 21 days to form a habit. And what I'm learning is that that's sort of a minimum. It's going to take at least 21 days to begin forming a new habit. So it does require a little bit of discipline. But um, the easiest way and the fastest way to do it to, to, to kind of establish a new program in practical terms, I've found is to number one, make sure that you understand how your brain actually operates and especially at certain times of the day. So yeah, I, you, you wanted me to kind of talk a little bit about what's in the, uh, in the second chapter about brainwave patterns. And if, if people know this great, this will be a good review, but, uh, this is, this is probably the piece of our work that, that blows people's minds the most when you start learning about how, okay, your brain actually slows down and slowing down when your brain is in its slower states, uh, is actually where it allows you to get results the fastest, right? So, right, I'll I'll introduce our listeners to what I call the fraternity of beta, alpha, theta, delta. <laughs> uh, so, if if you study what are called br- brain wave patterns, and by the way, brain waves, uh, this is not like psycho babble mumbo jumbo. Your your brain is actually both a transmitter and a receiver of electromagnetic vibration. Right. So when you hear all the hippy dippy woo woo people talk about, you know, the law of attraction and oh your vibrational state, I shouldn't even sound like I'm making fun hey of man, it or being you've sarcastic. You've about five shows we've done. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I, I, I don't know you're listen. not. You're very supportive of it. I know. I know. Money. I'm extremely supportive of it. In fact, if you read the book, you understand that I'm a huge I'm 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 actually kind of making fun of the people who who diss that. Um. Right, because people sometimes have this tendency to go, oh, hippy dippy, touchy feely, woo woo. Don't talk to me about the law of attraction, and oh, I'm vibing. But that stuff is real, man. Your brain is legitimately a transmitter and receiver of electromagnetic vibration. It operates just like a radio, right? Like when you tune your radio into a certain frequency of of gigahertz or megahertz or whatever the hertz it is, you get a different, you get different outputs, right? You turn your FM radio to one station, you get country music, move it over to another station, you dial into a different frequency, you get hip hop and your brain's the same way at different frequencies. It does different things, right? So kind of in order from, you know, uh, highest and fastest vibration to lowest, uh, I'll, I'll just give the quick version of it here. When your brain is opera is is vibrating at its highest and fastest rate, those are what's called beta brain waves. This is how you run through most of your day. It's the highest frequency but lowest amplitude brain waves. When your brain is in a predominantly beta state, um, it's like I guess there's not a whole lot of training that we need to do about it because this is just how you sort of move through your day. It's associated with alertness, with being awake. It's known as the highest arousal state. So you feel the most like alert, awake, and energetic when you've got beta waves going on. Um, and that that's great. You spend the majority of your waking hours in the in the beta brainwave state. So let's drop down a level and talk about the alpha brainwave state. If you looked at it on on a on a graph, what you would see is that the beta brainwave pattern is slower, it's lower frequency but it's higher amplitude The each wave is, 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 is sort of stronger, carries more force behind it. You'll find that you are, your, your brain is going to naturally transition through a predominantly alpha brainwave pattern two times per day. It's going to happen within roughly the first 15 to 30 minutes that you're awake in the morning. And then it's going to happen again as you're winding down to go to sleep at night. The kind of the key indicator, Aiden, that you're experiencing an alpha pattern is that you're deeply relaxed, right? M- more so than just like your, um, you know, your 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 normal state of relaxation when you, it, yeah, when you're um like when you you know when you're wait you, you're getting up in the morning and you're out of bed but you're not like quite all there yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. You're still kind of your joints are still maybe a little bit creaky. Your brain's still a little. Let's just say you're still in the waking up process. 
Um, and the neat thing about the alpha, when you're in that state, is that the alpha brainwave pattern is strongly associated with learning and, mem and, and memory and recall. Like you remember stuff better and recall stuff better when your brain is in an alpha state, when you're more relaxed. In our memory training workshops that we've taught for 20 years, one of the biggest things that we teach is that stress is the number one killer of your memory. Because stress, what it does is it speeds up your heart rate, speeds up your brain waves. And when your brain waves get too fast, it's it makes it much harder to remember stuff, right? Like if you've ever go back to the thing about remembering people's names. I mean, if you've ever been in the spot, not not the spot where you met somebody and then five seconds later you can't remember their name, but if you've ever been in the spot where you like bumped into somebody in the grocery store and you knew that you knew them and they were going, Hey, Aiden, nice <laughs> to see you. And you're going, hey, big guy. <laughs> <laughs> stop stop telling everybody my secrets. Okay, I call everybody you know. big guy. Uh, and if you've ever been in that spot where you're like having this con – you're having this nice, polite conversation with this person. Hey, how's the family? How's work? Et cetera, et cetera. How's that thing going? But the whole time you're talking to them, your brain is like going a million miles an hour going, what's the name? What's the name? What's his name? Who the heck am I talking to here? <laughs> well, it, it's in, if you if you can kind of make like almost a little experiment out of this because what will typically happen there is that you won't remember the person's name while they're standing in front of you, but you will remember it later, right? Like it'll come to you as soon as they leave or like, you know, maybe like as you're falling asleep that night, sometime after the incident – it's like this little voice in your head goes, hey, do you want that name now? And you're like, no, nah, stupid. I needed it 20 minutes ago. <laughs> the elephant. It is. It's kind of the elephant going, hey, do you want that name now? And you're like, no, 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 doofus. I needed it 10 minutes ago. Because right? you can't call the guy up and go, hey, your name's Bob. He's not impressed at that point. So the point is, the reason why that happens is because you relaxed. You actually took a breath. Your brain waves slowed down, dropped down into an alpha point. And that's where you're able to remember things. But the key is that th this is – we literally teach our clients in many ways to just relax their way to success. When you're in a high stakes, high pressure situation, confrontational, you know, any, anything like a – anything that looks like a confrontation or where your anxiety level is coming up, you will perform much better if you simply take a deep breath. That sounds like so like I'm just your mom. Oh, take a deep breath, sonny boy. But it – it's one of the most effective um, – it's one of the most effective performance-enhancing techniques is just to breathe. Just breathe. It slows you down in ways that you get where you want to go much faster. You know those moments where you're up against a deadline and maybe you're writing a paper or you need to get an email out and you go, I just need to get this email out. You'll catch yourself sometimes. You haven't taken a breath. It's important to know the opposite as well. And then when you're in those states, you have high levels of carbon dioxide in your body. And when you're taking in the oxygen, you release that again. And it changes your brain state. I think it's important when people notice. And the other thing I wanted to do just to connect the dots, Roger, is we have Amy Edmondson coming on next week's show. And she's the mother of this concept called psychological safety. And what it is, is in an organization, when there's less stress and people are all on the same level, they think better and they make better decisions and they make more logical decisions and more better long-term decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of innovation fails because people are afraid to speak up and they're in that state of not thinking straight, essentially. And I think that's what I love about your work. You're talking about the individual, you coach individuals, high-level business people and others to be able to manage that stress themselves because there's two levels here. There's the individual and then there's the organization, which is a collection of individuals. Bingo. I just wanted to throw that in there. No, it's awesome. This just made me think of one of my favorite quotes ever. John Wooden, who widely recognized as possibly the greatest coach of, of all time, was famous for saying, move quickly, don't hurry. When you try and hurry, it creates tension, which actually slows you down. Alpha state strongly associated with learning. Come, come back, back to the idea of when that happens in the morning. Okay, there's, there's an application coming here. Uh, let's finish out the discussion here about, about brainwave patterns, though. The next one down, the next slowest but strongest one is what we call is, is what's known as the, the theta brainwave pattern. And this is where you can make some real magic happen. Again, uh, lower frequency, so slower than even alpha, 
bigger waves, so stronger than alpha, you only really experience brief moments in the theta brainwave pattern typically the way that you can kind of know it, it's what we ca- I call it the borderline state. It's kind of right on the borderline between being asleep and awake. You know how like r- right away when you wake up in the morning, like first thing when your eyes open, you're technically awake, but you're kind of not sure if you're awake, right? Like it's a, the, 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 when your brain's in a theta state, it's a, li- it's a little twilight zoney. You, it, you're not sure. It feels like may- maybe I'm, I'm still dreaming what city am I in? It's it's a little it's a little weird there. Well, here's the cool thing about the theta brainwave state is that when your brain is in a theta state, you have direct access to your subconscious brain. What it means is that your elephant, your elephant is listening very closely with no filter. The, the, the ant part of your brain hasn't sort of caught up yet. And so you've got this window when you're in a theta. And there's a lot of there's a lot of great stuff that's been written and recorded about how to use the theta state. I'm trying to keep it simple here. Whatever goes in, whatever input goes into your brain in those moments, understand it goes in unfiltered and downloads directly into your subconscious you will carry that input with you all day long, whether you want to or not. And so this is why you hear so much talk and so many of the gurus and high performance people have systems that they teach and implement for winning their morning. The reason why, and I don't care who you, who you talk to, you read the miracle morning or you listen to Tim Ferriss or whoever, whoever it is that you want to listen to. That's about high performance. They're all going to talk to you about winning your morning, starting your day off. Right. It's because the first couple minutes of your day, you'll have that window where you're in theta. It's typically only the first like 30 seconds to maybe a couple minutes that you're awake in the morning and then it happens again for a few seconds while you're falling asleep at night and you can influence those moments. And if you can influence those moments, your brain works on autopilot all day long, which is why I I have this. Some people think this is super just corny and weird, but I've developed this habit. It was drilled into my head in my first sales job, wake up in the morning. And as soon as your eyes pop open, I say this is going to be a great day. And I think this is important. You say this in the book as well. It's so important because when we wake up, we're usually going, oh, now I'll snooze. Oh, it's, oh. And then you start thinking about the problems of the day ahead or the flip side, because you say win the morning, but win the night as well, win the evening. Because again, you're back in that brain wave and you're programming yourself going, we're worrying about the things that you did today, the mistakes you made, perhaps all the worries and woes that you have, rather than actually focus on the visions that you have and the clarity of purpose that you have. But first, you have to do that work. So I just want to throw that in because we're, we're going to run out of time. But I want to get our listeners to get the most out of this possible. Yeah. Start and finish your day. Like if people are going, OK, what do I do with this? You don't know, Roger, my life is such that, you know, I work an insane number of hours and I'm I, I, I'm, I'm OK with that. I literally only I, I legitimately only have like five seconds a day to make my life better. I can tell you exactly which five seconds I would focus on. It would be the first five seconds of your day. And if you can just simply declare, if you can develop the discipline or some kind of system to wake up in the morning and actually say or at least think something good and positive, you'll carry it with you all day long. Because that that whole thing that we talked about before about where your elephant goes, okay, I'll go get that for you, is super powerful. And you get that reaction strongest right when you wake up in the morning. So, yeah, I wake up in the morning, Aiden, and I say, it's going to be a great day. And the reason I do that is because I know my elephant, unfiltered, hears that and goes, great day. Okay, I'll go get that for you. And I have great days all the time. I'll I'll also tell you that if if a person wakes up in the morning and goes, oh, God, this is going to (laughs) suck. What happens there is your elephant goes, gonna suck. Okay, I'll go get that for you. It can be overcome. 
right? But you've got like if, if that's how you start, you've got work to do to dig yourself out of that hole. When you start your day, you know what? When you start your day and go, this is going to be a great day, and your elephant goes, great day. All right, let's do it. Well, then I'll tell you that the rest of the world's got some work to do if it's going to try and bring you down. It's corny. It's simple. It doesn't take any time, but it's crazy powerful. And then the last thing, the, the last brainwave state is the delta state. This is when you're totally unconscious. It's associated with healing and recovery and really the best way to harness it. I know we're starting to run out of time here, but it's worth talking about because it's sort of the ultimate slow down to, to get faster, slow yourself down to get better results, is that you need to get a good night's sleep. Your brain, when your brain, when you go to sleep and you get some decent quality sleep, it's, that's what's necessary for your body and your brain to sort of begin the, your, your healing and recovery processes. If, if a person is looking for, um, the closest thing that I know of to, uh, just a, a magic box, a fountain of youth as it were. Just get some sleep. It does so much for your energy and your performance and your focus and your clarity and your calm and your ability to deal with people. Get a proper night's sleep and watch the difference. This is now starting to actually catch on in boardrooms and in the high performance community. It's it's nice to see where hotshot executives and some of the wealthiest people in the world are now starting to wear eight hours of sleep as a badge of honor, as opposed to, yeah, I haven't slept in three weeks. I'm so awesome. Now you're a moron. And actually, the other thing is that learning happens when you sleep. Therefore, it sticks. Because what I love about this book is that the whole idea of slowing down is to go, look, if we put everything in its right place and understand it, then we can actually build it back in a way that works for you because it's modular. That's why I use that term, the Lego bricks. We were running out of time, but there was one really important thing, and this is a message, I suppose, for everybody listening, is that we have these default modes for a reason, and I'd love if you shared these, because it doesn't mean everybody's broken, it doesn't mean that we're at fault, and it doesn't mean that we've made mistakes, but if we understand that the default modes there are for a positive reason, then we can understand we can actually use them to our benefit. Right. This is something that everybody needs to be aware of, is what we call your brain's unhelpful default settings. You've often heard people talk about how your brain is like the most miraculous and complex computer ever invented. And, and it really is true. And like a computer, your brain has default settings, wiring issues that we sort of come pre-programmed with. There's three big ones that we always talk about with our clients that are what we call unhelpful. What these actually are is, you, you, like you said, it, it doesn't mean that people are broken certainly not damaged beyond repair. These are just wiring issues that we all come pre-programmed with, where if you're not dealing with them proactively, they can really prevent you from where, getting where we want to go. The reason that they're there is because they're great survival mechanisms, right? Um, I'll lay them out for you in just a second, but all three of the default settings that we'll discuss, if you, th if, if, if you lived in the wilderness, Aiden, like as a hunter-gatherer, these are fantastic for keeping you alive but in terms of being a high performance individual in today's world, they're counterproductive. So, yeah, let's get them on the table. Number one is that the human brain has this strong tendency to overemphasize negative and underemphasize positive. We're like we're literally hardwired to be hyper hypersensitive to the quote unquote negative influences that we encounter. And we almost tend to like ignore or dismiss the more positive, helpful inputs that we receive. Um, and, and again, if, if you go back, if you think about this in terms of if you lived in the wilderness, this is a very helpful piece of wiring, right? Because if you lived in the wilderness as a hunter gatherer, um, the quote unquote negative input is really negative. Uh, like it's a grizzly bear that's actively trying to kill you and eat you. And if you live in the wilderness, there's that, that, that you, you've got things that are actively trying to kill you and eat you around every corner. So in that scenario, the individual who's wired to be more sensitive to a threat like that is actually better equipped to deal with the threat, right? They'll spot it sooner. Therefore, they have a head start and they'll be able to deal with it in a way that they're going to not die. So it's great if you live in the wilderness. The issue is that we don't live in the wilderness. We live in 
cubicles and offices and boardrooms and hotels and, and homes. And we just don't live in that level of a hostile environment anymore. And so this wiring can sort of turn on us and it can create a number of a bunch of dynamics that will really drain your energy. It creates cultures of negativity. It creates constant worry that's counterproductive. It causes problems, right? So that's number one is we've got this default setting where we overemphasize negative and, and underemphasize positive. The second one, um, and this one drives people crazy, is we have this tendency, you, your brain is easily consumed with the urgent matter at the expense of the important matter. Easily consumed with the urgent at the expense of the important. I think most of your listeners, I'm sure, have this vocabulary of you know urgent versus important. Well, your brain is wired to be just totally consumed with the urgent thing. Like your brain is hardwired to take your focus and just direct that focus to just literally whatever stupid thing just popped up in front of your face because it just popped up in front of your face. It doesn't matter what it is that just pops up in front of your face. It also doesn't matter how critically important what you were previously doing is. Whatever just popped up in front of your face, squirrel, that's what's going to get your attention, right? Right. Um, and again, if you lived in the wilderness, that's helpful because if if you are in the situation where a grizzly bear wants to eat you, I promise the grizzly bear wants to eat you now, right? He's not <laughs> sending you out, right? He's not sending you a calendar invite to like come eat you next week. That's happening right now. So you need to know that right now and you need to take action right now. But what it does to us in 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 our lives is this tendency, well, just think about how easily and quickly your mind becomes distracted. Like, I mean, you can be working on the most important thing in the world and like a cat walks by your window and boom, your brain is off in a different direction. I learned this recently. It takes your brain because of this wiring. It takes your brain about a thousandth of a second to get off track, to get distracted from something that you're doing. And then it's going to take somewhere between four and 20 minutes for your brain to re-engage with what you were doing previously. And it creates this huge energy drain. So it's not fair, but it is reality. Your brain is wired to, to distract you. So you're going to need to do something about it. And then the, the third unhelpful default setting that we always talk about is that your brain craves safety over progress. It craves safety over progress. Everybody, of course, especially your listeners, want to make progress. Right. I mean, if I walked up to any of your listeners and said, hey, would you like next year to be better than this year? Well, duh, everybody wants to make progress logically, but biologically, your brain actually craves safety, um, which makes sense if you live in the wilderness. Right. If you live in the wilderness, your physical safety has to be your number one priority at all times, because the minute you let down your guard, that's when you're going to get eaten by a grizzly bear. But in our world now. What you would actually want to do is take the word safety and substitute it with the words familiarity or comfort. The reason why people and organizations gravitate so strongly to the activities and the thought patterns that are familiar and comfortable is because your brain actually perceives those things as safe. And your brain craves that safety. This is the wiring that makes people and organizations resistant to change. It's the wiring that creates our comfort zone, which, you know, it's ultimately is not wrong to have a comfort zone. It's just that no growth happens inside your comfort zone. Everything that we do that creates progress lives outside of that comfort zone. But your brain always wants to choose the comfort zone. So you're just going to have to be working on that. That was one of the beautiful lines that I took from this from an innovation disruption perspective was logically you want progress, but biologically your brain craves safety. And that is the challenge for any transformation, whether it be organizational or personal. Roger, where can people find out more about you? You do coaching, you work with organizations, etc. Where can people find out more about your work? Sure. You can find me personally on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Just look for Roger Seip. It's S-E-I-P is the last name. I'm not a huge Twitter person, but I'm on social media. Our website is freedompersonaldevelopment.com. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's freedompersonaldevelopment.com. And um, yeah, get in touch. If a person needs a great speaker, a high-performance coach, somebody to talk to, get a good laugh from and some wisdom, 
That's what we do for business people. We help business people keep their head on straight so that they go get awesome results and love their life in the process. So yeah, come find me. I'd love to talk to you. Author of Master Your Mind, Counterintuitive Strategies to Refocus and Re-Energize Your Runaway Brain, Roger Sipe, thank you for joining us. Aiden, this has been so much fun. I hope we get to do it again. Thanks for having me, Aiden. Have an awesome day.